Um, before I get into the message today, um, you have the picture that I sent a couple weeks ago, Josh? If you could put that up. Uh, I want to drop a bug in your ear about fall of 2017. I gotta wait for the picture to give you the bug. A couple weeks ago, uh, I got a an email from TJ. Uh, it was a very encouraging and a, a blessing email. Uh, TJ went with Dennis and Jeannie and Christy and I to Israel last October, and we were unaware that he had even taken this picture. We're outside of Jerusalem. I think we are walking towards. Um, I want to say the Lion's Gate, but I, I don't think that's correct. Um, if Dennis were here, he'd probably remember which gate that was. At, but uh, I want to put a bug in your ear. Fall of 2017, I would like as many people as possible in our church to go to Israel. There is something unique about that land. There's something special. Because God created all of the heavens. He created all of the earth. And yet, Jerusalem is where he will make his home. Jerusalem is a place where the manifest presence of God will dwell with man. And there is just a uniqueness about that land. Uh, when we were there, um, a lot of you might remember last October, the Day of Rage in Jerusalem. Um, we never knew anything about it until we read the news when we got home that night. We were back to the hotel that night. Um, I would encourage as many of you as can possibly do it, start putting your pennies away. Start making arrangements. Make plans. Uh, usually it's October, sometimes November uh, of 2017. We want to go with the Zola Levitt Tours. Uh, they, they partner with Emmanuel Tours. Emmanuel Tours are Messianic Jews. Okay, They're people of the Jewish faith and upbringing that have come to realize the completion, the promised Messiah has come. And they have a unique understanding of the scripture that we in the West do not have. And it's an absolute amazing thing to hear their insight on the things that we interpret in our Western Greek analytical thinking that they interpret in their Eastern Jewish thinking as something radically different. Now, that's not to say that God's word is misleading or confusing. It's to say that God's word supersedes culture. Okay? And, and to hear their insight and to be in the places where Jesus walked. To be able to stand at the top of Mount Carmel and look out over Tarmagedo, Tarmagedo, where Armageddon will be fought, and to see all of the places across the valley, you see Nazareth, where, where Jesus grew up, and, and looking off to the south, you can, you can see um, down toward Jerusalem and the pass where the armies would come up, because Megiddo is where the, the, the last battle where Armageddon will be fought. Um, and it's, it's not without... It's not an accident that that place is where it is. Um, it, I love the fact that Israel, um, God says that he has put his name on that land. And they have found somebody with Google Earth was able to actually look down in Israel and see the ravines north of Israel. The Tetragrammaton in, in Hebrew is written out. The letters that spell Yahweh. And the letter Shin that is used to represent God is formed by the three valleys that make up Jerusalem. So when God says he literally put his name on the land, he did. He, he placed the land in such a way that his name would be reflected. So I would encourage you, um, it's not something that you want to miss. Okay? Uh, and, and I'll share with you, for years and years and years, up until about four years ago, I had zero desire to ever go to Jerusalem to ever go to Israel. Uh, I looked at the news and thought, oh, yay, let's go tour while dodging bullets. I can go to New York. Um, but God really started changing my heart about that place. 
and and for whatever reason, God has marked that as unique among all of the world and all of the universe. Okay, so um, fall 2017. Uh, just to let you know, the cost is approximately five thousand dollars a person. You've got to get yourself to New York and back. So if you can get a good deal there, you can save money there. But from New York to Israel, all the stuff in Israel and home, it's, it's just, uh, when we went, it was just under $4,000. I don't know what it'll be then, but start putting your money back, okay? This is an incredible thing. It's, a, it's something you will never forget. Right, Vivian? Right. Right, because Vivian got to go on the one previous to when we went. So, okay. Um, open your Bibles. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> um, just a <clears throat> side note. Uh, a lot of people have been watching the news and they see things like the uh, Dallas massacre. Man fired on police officers wounding 12, uh, four or five of whom died. And they say, how can there be a God that would let things like this happen? And, and I think that things like that happening are one of the greatest supports for God. And the reason I think that is not because God desires the, the murder, that God desires the conflict, that God desires the hatred that drives that, but that any rational person can identify that as wrong. This is not right. There's something about this that does not mesh with the way things should be that speaks to a, a morality that is common amongst man. And you can't get a common morality with a theory that doesn't have a creator that input that morality into man. Okay? And, and you may have people that even agree, oh yeah, you know, that, that guy I hit, he was doing good by killing all those cops, those, those murdering, okay, you know, that's twisted, and we can see that it's twisted. To me, that is a very clear indication that there is a God who has a, a level of, of the way that we should act, and the fact that we fall so short of it should be a very clear indication that He is in every way superior to us. So I look at those things, and, and I go, I mean, that's horrific. It, it's, it's disgusting. It's, it's disheartening, but it encourages me because I think it shows that there is a God that puts something inside of me to recognize all of those things about that act. Okay, uh, Pray for our police officers. Okay, Scripture says that we should pray for those who keep the peace. Okay, um, They're under attack. And it's, it's not just an attack by... Um, people with sick and twisted minds. It is a drive that has a political agenda. Um, and I'm not saying I'm not saying it's a Democrat drive. I'm not saying it's a Republican drive. I'm just saying that there is an agenda that is driving this, and we need to pray for those people who put their lives on the line every day to keep us safe. Uh, a couple days ago, I had to talk with Thaddeus. He's in Drivers Inn. I had to talk to him about stuff I was never talked to about when driving, when a police officer pulls you over. Um, when I was learning to drive, if a police officer pulled you over, it was considered respectful to step out of the car. You don't do that anymore. You, you put your stuff on the dashboard, put your hands on the steering wheel, because they need to know that you are not a threat. And I had to tell him things that I never had to think about when I was a kid. Um, <clears throat> those guys are putting their lives on the line every stop they make, everything they do in, in uniform. 
So keep them covered in red. Also our other um, responders, the, the EMTs, the paramedics, the uh, firemen, keep those guys bathed in prayer. So <clears throat> getting to today's message, I got a question for you, and I want you just to kind of keep it in your head. Uh, I know what your answer is going to be in the immediate because you're going to answer what I just talked about. But the question that I want you to ponder as you go throughout the week is, <coughs> what are you thinking about? What's on your mind? See, I have spoken several times in other messages. I believe that the Word is very clear that we are to control our thoughts. That it is a discipline that we as believers are called to, to control our thoughts. Now, let me preface this by saying that this message is for believers. Okay? Because you have to be sealed with God's Spirit. His Spirit has to be living and working in you for these principles to be played out in your life. Okay? Now, you can get some measure of success just in your own strength by following the directives of Scripture, but ultimately our strength fails, doesn't it? God never fails. Okay? So, <clears throat> We're in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to pick up starting in verse 3. Paul says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now I want to pause there for just a second. Okay? This, this is one of those dynamic scriptures that should be an encouragement to believers. Okay, for, for a couple reasons. First, it lets us know where the battle is being fought. Okay, All too often, we think the battle is being fought on, on a physical plane. Okay, and, and it's me against that person, or us against them. But that's not what Paul is saying here. Okay? He says, um, we walk in the flesh, that's, that's our life, that's what we're living out, is in the flesh. We are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. God has not armed you to fight in a fleshly contest. His, his weapons are much more superior <coughs> than those. Okay? But they have divine power to destroy strongholds. Divine power. That means God's power. And, and as far as I have seen in anything I've read and, and experienced in my life, God's power is greatly more than my own. And greatly more than your own. So His divine power... The weapons that he gives us are to destroy strongholds. Now, all too often when I hear this, this passage of Scripture quoted, they stop right there. And then they start labeling what those strongholds are. Now, I'm not going to minimize God's Word, because I believe in a, in a lot of cases that that's fitting and appropriate, but that's not what Paul is saying, because the next verse he clarifies what those strongholds are. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. Now, if we stop right there, that would seem like we're going out to fight the world, right? Those that have an opinion uh, contrary to Scripture, um, those who um, would argue against the existence of God or the nature of God. And, and we could take that right there and, and we would develop a theology based on that where we would be confrontational. And yet, the first rule of hermeneutics, that's a fancy word for Bible study, hermeneutics, 
Okay? I, I paid thousands of dollars so I could use that word. Okay? So you got it for free. Is that all scripture is interpreted in light of all scripture? Okay, so you can't just take one passage and you take it out of the context in which it was given and you brand it as your own and you make a stand on that scripture that is out of step with the rest of scripture. Okay? Because this is not what Paul is saying here. Alright? If we stop right there, we walk away with a misunderstanding, a misapprehension of scripture. Because he finishes this by saying and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So where is this war being waged? Right here. In this mostly empty space between our ears. Okay? And then he, he finishes this thought by saying, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Now, take every thought captive. We have this, this thing where, you know, I spoke about the enemies of our soul. <clears throat> we have this kind of mental picture that the devil is walking around behind us, whispering in our ear all of these evil things. <clears throat> no. Quite honestly, with as much trouble as our flesh gives us, as we indulge our flesh, the devil could be on vacation and we'd still be in trouble. Okay? Because our problem is in the fallen nature that we were born into and raised up in, and then when God's Spirit comes in and He expunges all of our sin, we've got to start choosing to walk a different path. And for some of us, the paths that we have dug for the majority of our lives, they're deep and they're ruts and that's hard to get out of, aren't they? Those are the thoughts that we are waging war against. Okay? And it's insidious. Okay? These thoughts that work their way into our thinking and into our living and into our being that are not godly, but we just accept them for what they are. And we just go on along with them. So, we want to destroy the arguments the lofty opinion. I love the word, the lofty opinion. Uh, what other translations, what, what do they say there where it says lofty opinion in the ESV? We have NIV or NASP? Pretension. I'm sorry? Pretension. Pretension. Okay. Any other words? Proud. Sorry? Proud. Proud. <clears throat> Proud. I love this because you don't really often venture your opinion unless you're proud of it, unless you think it's a good opinion, unless you, you know, you, you've got some <clears throat> to that opinion, right? Um, you know, when, when they did the last Super Bowl, I had no opinion. I didn't care. The Broncos weren't in it. Who cares who wins? Okay? Were the Broncos in the last one? They won it, didn't they? <laughs> See? Okay, let, let's, let's rabbit trail for just a second. Lots of God's Spirit and a broken TV broke me of my football hat. Okay? Um, so, so, I don't really keep up with the football except when people show up wearing Seahawks and Broncos stuff. Then I go, oh, must be football season. Okay? So, I, I don't keep up with that a heck of a lot. So... <clears throat> We have these proud opinions that we hold on to and are very fond of. But we need to tear them down. And so we're going to jump over to another scripture. Um, keep up with me if you will. Because I'm, I'm going to present... Scripture always gives us the way God desires it to be. Okay? But God doesn't leave us just hanging there with this expectation that we're going to figure it all out and get from point A to point B on our own. Okay? So right now, we're presenting the problem, if you will, which is actually the solution, but in identifying the solution, we have to identify the problem. 
Okay, so the problem is our, our proud thoughts, our proud opinions, and those thoughts that set themselves up, those arguments that set themselves up in opposition to what God says. Okay, so let's let's look uh, a little bit further. We're going to flip over to uh, Colossians chapter three. <clears throat> I'm going to start in verse 1. Colossians 3, verse 1. It says, If then you have been raised with Christ... So this, this is a, a, a condition here. Okay? Have you been raised with Christ? Okay. Are, are you a believer? Okay. Is Jesus Christ both your Lord and Savior? Okay, then this applies to you. Okay, so that, that condition has to be met before we can move on. Seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So here's this same condition where we are directed to take our thoughts and put them in a particular place. We're to order them. Okay? Now, Paul, who wrote both of these letters, is not speaking into his hat. Okay? There's a method to his, his, his thinking here. Now, when we have thoughts that are not godly. Now, there's two things that I want to address as we get into how we can direct our thoughts, the, the how-to. Um, first, you will have thoughts that pop into your head that are not godly. Okay? That's not the sin. Okay? Because the sin, uh, when those thoughts pop in, if you reject those, you deny those, you have overcome temptation. The sin comes in when you start playing with those. Okay? When those thoughts pop into your head and you dwell on them. And you don't resist them. You don't deny them. Okay? So you need to understand that first you're going to have things, you're going to have thoughts that pop into your head that are not godly. <gasps> oh my! It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. Okay? Second, it's the dwelling on those thoughts that is sin. Okay? So, how do we stop this? I've, I've got a list of six different steps. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Okay? Mark that. We're not going to read the whole thing. But this is right after Jesus' baptism. And he goes out into the wilderness. Okay? And he goes out there for a specific reason. He goes out to confront the devil. Okay? And the devil is going to tempt him. And so Jesus goes out. Does the devil come right away? Uh -huh. No. Scripture tells us that he went, that Jesus went without eating for 40 days. I, I have a hard time understanding that. I mean, the longest period of time that I went without eating was about 10 days. And that was because of a, a medical thing that happened. And that was kind of enforced. It was not by my choice. Okay? And I'll tell you what, I found it, I, I think it's sick now when I look back on it, but laying in the hospital bed looking at McDonald's chicken nuggets <laughs> and wanting those desperately, you know there was something off in it. Okay? I'm looking at those that, you know, you can't even identify what is in that. Okay, it's probably from a chicken, but I'm not sure it's an edible part. And I'm, I'm, I would 
would give anything for a nugget. <laughs> I'd even use the hot mustard on it. Okay? But Jesus went 40 days. Now, after 40 days, um, you got to understand that the, that the physical weakness that he was feeling had to extend into other areas. Okay? Your, your thinking becomes fuzzy. All right? You're, you're, you're not in the best shape to present an intellectual argument. So Jesus goes out. He goes without food. He fasts for 40 days and nights. And then the devil comes. Now, does the devil typically come at you when you're strong? No. no. He likes to come at you when you're weak. Okay? When, when you just feel like, I'm just at the point of giving up. That's when he comes knocking at the door. Right? So the devil shows up and he starts tempting Jesus. Now, you know, I said we weren't going to read it, but actually we are going to read it. Because there's, there's a couple things that I want to point out that we need to understand in how we control our thoughts. Okay? Because you have to understand this is the same thing that happens to us. The temptation comes in and then we have to do something with it. So see, Jesus had these thoughts because the devil gave them to him. But he didn't sin. Because he resisted them, he rejected them. So, verse 1, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He went there on purpose. Okay? It wasn't an accident. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. You think? I mean, yeah. I love how obvious some things can be. Just in case you were wondering, you know, after 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Okay, there's, there's temptation one. There is rejection one. Okay. How did Jesus reject what the devil was trying to tempt? He quoted scripture. Okay, so number two, here we go, verse five. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. Something you need to understand is that, that uh, the, the words of Scripture in and of themselves without the power of the Spirit of God can ring hollow. You, you can manipulate Scripture to say whatever you want. Okay? Um, Christy, if, if any of you have heard her testimony, she tells about her blue lightning days. Okay? And, and those were the days when the Spirit of God, she would just, just encounter the Spirit of God and, and she was so in love and, and she would take her Bible out. Is it okay if I share this yeah. story now that I've already started? Because yeah. um, I, I, you know, I don't want to start my fast when we get home and she refuses to feed me. Um, so, and one of the things that she would do is she would go out and she'd sit at the park bench and she'd open her Bible and say, God, you turn it to the page that you want me to read. And the wind would blow and she'd read which, you know, when mine just blows too fast and I can't read it. But, but then, you know, that would, that would, oh, this is what God has for me today. Now, can God use that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But doesn't God want us to be a little bit more mature in how we approach His Word? Okay. And thankfully, the Blue Lightning Days came to an end and, and Christy moved on into Bible study instead of just Bible reading. Okay. Um, that reminds me of the man who did kind of the same thing. He said, God, I want you to show me something from your word, something specific to me. And so he took his Bible and, and trusting God, he opened it up and he read, Judas went and hanged himself. And he closed his Bible and he opened it up and it said, go thou and do likewise. <laughs> now, I don't think that was God, do you? And yet both of those things came right out of scripture, didn't they? Okay, so um, devil is quoting scripture to his own ends. Okay, 
Context, context, context. All right? So moving on, Jesus said to him, we're in verse 7, Jesus said to him, Again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him. The end. That's not what it says, is it? No, because look what it says here. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. In Luke, it actually says the devil left him until a more opportune time. See, that's something we need to be on our guard about. The devil is always looking for our weaknesses. Peter actually tells us that, that the devil, that we have to be on our guard, for the devil is a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Okay? We have to always be prepared. Now, the thing that I want to point out to you in this passage, and you're thinking, okay, how does this have to do with controlling my thoughts? Okay, Each of these temptations that were brought before Jesus were things that the devil thought would tempt him. Okay, Because it's, it's the kind of stuff that the devil would like, right? I mean, who wants to be hungry? Okay, Who, who doesn't want uh, God to prove himself? Prove himself to them. And, and of course, the one that tripped the devil up in the first place, who doesn't want power? Right. So, obviously, the devil thought these were going to be real temptations for Jesus. But the way that Jesus responded was with an accurate understanding of what Scripture said. Okay, so point number one. Know the Word. Know the Word intimately. Be familiar with it. Okay? If the only word that you get through the course of your day is a particular passage at the top of your daily bread or your guidepost, you're not getting enough. You're starving. Okay? You're ill-equipped for the battle. Okay? Get in the Word. Quit looking at chapters and verses. Okay? Just set those things aside. If you can find, there are Bibles out there in most translations that, that do away with the chapters and verses. Read those. Okay? It's, it's convenient for us to have chapter and verse because I can tell you where I'm reading and you can find it. But when you're reading for yourself, ignore those. Okay? Get rid of those so you can see how the letter was written, how God desired this to be presented. All right? So know the word. Memorize scripture. That's something that I so regret in the church today is that we don't emphasize memorizing scripture enough. Okay? It's like when you get to a certain level in Sunday school, you've achieved it. You've, you've memorized all that is necessary. No, know it. Make it a habit to study the Word and memorize the Scripture. Okay, Get to the point when the devil comes and tempts you, you know what the Word says about that particular temptation. Okay, So number one, know the Word. And be prepared because the enemy knows the Word too. And he can make that word dance and sing a pretty little tune, but it may not be what God intends. Two, we have to live a life of prayer. It's got to be a lifestyle. Okay? Uh, I, you know, there are, it's appropriate and necessary to have time set aside specifically to pray. Okay, uh, Christy and I have a, a couple of markers throughout the day that we watch for so, so we know to pray. Okay, But Paul says that we are to pray without ceasing. And, and the only way that you can do that is if you're in constant communication with God. Okay, You, you just kind of talk just like we're talking. You know, when, um, when you're going out with your friends and you're doing something, um, you, you just talk, right? Unless you're fishing with Travis and then you don't talk at all. <laughs> you kind of prefer you didn't breathe loud. Okay, But, but you, you're just in this constant state of communication where God 
is so familiar with you, you're, you're so familiar with him, that, that you just kind of talk as you go throughout the day. Um, you know, it's, it's cool because we, we make such a labor out of prayer. And yet if you look at how Jesus prayed through Scripture, he made it very simple. He was just talking. And, and we've so twisted the meaning of prayer that we've become like uh, Aladdin. You know, we feel like if we rub the magic Bible and say the magic words, we'll get everything we want. And that's such a minute part of what we are to be praying for. Okay, as a matter of fact, when Jesus presents the, the sample prayer, he doesn't even talk about praying for what we want. He talks about praying for what we need. Okay? And, and then just being in this attitude of prayer where when something comes up, when you're prompted and, and you're moved, you just pray. You just talk with God. Okay? Being in prayer. Now what this does is it facilitates a sensitivity to God's Spirit. Okay? Now, when you have studied the Word and you know the Word and you're, you're in the Word, it's a whole lot easier for God's Spirit to bring that Word to your remembrance. Okay? And so when temptation comes, when these thoughts pop into your head, you're immediately on guard. You're immediately sensitive to the wrong of the thought and you lay it down. You reject it. And you start defending yourself. Uh, James chapter 4 says that um, we are to humble ourselves before God and resist the devil and he will flee. We have this idea that if we, you know, the devil comes to us and we go, oh, I resist you. He flees. Sometimes you've got to do a lot of resisting before he runs. Okay? But the word promises he will flee. Keep resisting. Dig those feet in. Set your shoulders. Be unmoved. Don't let him, you know, oh gosh, it's been three and a half minutes and he's still here. <laughs> Sometimes it's, oh gosh, it's been three and a half years and he's still here. Don't give up. Okay? So, know the word. Be constant in prayer. Um, Matthew 26, 41. This is the, the garden. Jesus is in the garden. It's after... Um, the Passover. The Seder has been completed. They go out. They go out singing. They go to the garden and Jesus separates from most of the disciples. He takes uh, James, John, and Peter with him and he goes off a little further and he says, you guys stay here. I'm going to go over there and pray. And, and he comes back and what are Peter, James, and John doing? <laughs> Sleeping. Now, if you've ever been to our Seder and you understand the amount of alcohol they consumed during the Seder dinner because four times throughout the meal you are to fill your cup and drain it all at one shot and then you have just the regular drinking throughout the meal you understand that the alcohol was was making them probably pleasantly comfortable and dozy okay and and it was later in the evening and and they do what we would have done they drift off now when Jesus comes back and he finds him sleeping, he says something kind of interesting. He says, um, this is uh, chapter 26, verse 41. He says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Okay, so what are the, the, the two conditions that he sets first? Watch, and pray. watch be on your guard, pay attention, and pray. Okay? Pray. Be on your guard and be in communication with the Father. Alright? So, let's look at point number three. Proverbs 28, 26 says, you don't, don't bother turning there because I'm going to kind of speed through these a little quicker because we're coming to the end of our time. Um, 28, 26. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. <coughs> but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Now, we have a radically different understanding of fool than what is being addressed in Proverbs. When we say, um, you know, you're a fool, what do you think? 
When, when somebody uses the word fool, what do you think they're saying? You're an idiot. You're an idiot. Yeah, what, what I heard something over here? Idiot. Idiot, yeah. Okay, they're, they're, they're not all that bright, right? But, but when Proverbs is using fool, and, and almost exclusively throughout the Old Testament, when they talk about fool, what they are saying is that it's someone who really doesn't understand what they're about, and they're inclined to evil. Okay, so they're talking about someone who really doesn't understand what they're supposed to be doing, and their inclination is to do wrong. Okay, so with that understanding, look at what he's saying. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool because you're going to stumble, you're going to fall when you trust in your own ability to do things, to accomplish things. Okay, and then he, he uh, adds to it, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Okay, so the first point three, we need to understand that, that we can't do this in and of our own strength. Okay? We don't have the strength to resist on our own for a great length of time. Okay? So we have to know the Word so we can understand first what the temptation is when it comes, why it's a temptation. And we know what God would have us do with it. We have to pray. We have to be in constant communion with the Spirit of God to strengthen us so that we don't need to do it in our own strength. We don't need to trust on our own ability to overcome it. Number four. <clears throat> Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your hearts with all vigilance, for from it flows the spring of life. This is the Geigo principle. Does anybody know what Geigo is? It's an insurance. old computer term. Huh? I said insurance. Close. Garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. It's an old programming term. What, what it meant was, if you input the, the code incorrectly, the program wouldn't do what you wanted it to do. Okay? And sometimes that can be one keystroke. That can make all the difference between it working and not working. Okay? Garbage in, garbage out. When he says, keep your heart with all diligence... He's saying be careful what you put in. Be careful what you allow in. Okay? There's a lot of garbage out there, folks. And we consume it sometimes with a ravishing appetite. And we're putting this garbage in, not understanding that this is weakening us for the battle. That, that it's setting us up to fall, so when the deceiver comes, when the tempter comes, we're, we're confused, our thinking is muddled, our spirit is clouded. Okay? We get it everywhere. It's on the TV, it's on the radio, it's in a lot of our conversations, it's in the stuff we read. Okay? It's, it's a lot of times it's stuff we choose to do um, as our hobbies or as our, our relaxation things. We, we open the door and, and we think, oh, okay, well, I'm going to watch an R-rated movie as long as it doesn't have nudity. But then you get all the, the foul language and all the violence and we find that acceptable and that's garbage in. Okay? And then when you squeeze a sponge, what comes out of the sponge? Well, whatever's in the sponge comes out of the sponge. Okay? You're the same way. When you get squeezed, if you filled yourself up with garbage, guess what's coming out? Garbage. Okay? The Geigo principle. Guard your heart with diligence. Okay? <clears throat> Number five. Flip with me to Ephesians chapter 22. Chapter 22, no, that's not right. <laughs> Chapter 4, verse 22. A lot of you are trying to find chapter 22 in Ephesians, weren't you? I got the pastor's Bible, we have extra chapters. <laughs> Ephesians 
I'm going to pick up in, in verse 22. I don't like to do this because it's in the middle of a thought, but I want to focus on, on a, a series that, that uh, really addresses this point, okay? Um, we have been taught to put off our old self, okay? This is the, the thought that, that Paul is starting with. Uh, verse 22, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former nature of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay, you see that there is a, an ongoing decision here that we are facing all the time. It's the same idea that Paul puts forth when he's talking to the Galatians, and he says that you have to choose to uh, not walk according to the flesh, but to walk according to the Spirit. Okay? It's the same idea. So, moving forward, he says, uh, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief steal no longer, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So this is the, the theory of the idea of replacement. Okay? And this is something that you will find all throughout Scripture. Where you take something that is not of God and you remove it. But all too often we don't put back in its place something of God. Okay? Jesus talks about the casting out of demons. He says that when a demon is cast out, it goes to a dry place, an arid place, and wanders for a time. And when it comes back, if it founds, finds the house empty and swept and cleaned up, what does it do? Comes back in and invites seven others, more dangerous than itself, to join it. Okay? So the condition of the end is worse than the condition at the beginning. It's the same idea as the replacement theory. Okay, so when you identify an area that you need to reject, you need to put off, you need to get out, it's not enough to just get it out, you've got to put something in its place. Okay, we're, we're not designed to exist in a vacuum. Okay, so it's not enough to get the ick out, we need to put the good in. Alright, and you see what he's saying here, he, he lists a couple of examples for us. He says, you know, hey, if, if you steal, don't steal anymore, but work, honestly. And then he even goes further, and he doesn't just say work honestly. He says, but that's so you have, may have enough to give others. Then he says, um, don't let corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Oh my, this is huge. This is something that we don't like to talk about in the church, the way we talk, the things we say. The conversations we engage in, the idle stuff, idle garbage that vomits out of our mouths sometimes. But he says, don't let corrupting talk come out of your mouth. How, how much corrupting talk are we allowed to have come out of our mouth? Does this give us any room for flexibility? There's, there's no flexibility here. Okay? So, <clears throat> but only such as good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. See, if we could implement this replacement theory in our political discussions, they'd go a whole lot smoother, wouldn't they? I mean, we could disagree, but still be able to speak. I mean, good for building up, as fits the occasion, that may give grace to those who hear. Oh man, you don't hear a lot of grace in politics, do you? And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God for whom you were sealed to the day of redemption. And then he lists all of these things. He says, put them, put them away. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice. 
But it's not enough to put those away. It says, but be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Okay? Now here's this, this next verse. It's, it's kind of the, the, the core nugget of all of this. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Quit acting like yourself and act like God. Okay, did you get that? Don't be you. That's one of those things I absolutely hate. I hate it when Christians say, oh, just be yourself. Don't be yourself. You stink. <laughs> You're not a good person. Be like God. Be like Christ. That's what we should aspire to. We shouldn't seek fulfillment in being ourselves. What have we got to impress anyone? What have we got to impress God? Who is really the only one we should be seeking to impress. See, our measure is not those around us. Our measure is Jesus Christ. Replacement. Identify what is wrong, get rid of it, and replace it with something good. Last point. Be discerning and cautious in who you choose to be friends with. Who you choose to associate with. Okay? 1 Corinthians 15.33 Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Proverbs 13.20 Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Be careful, be careful, be careful whom you would choose to associate with. I know so many brothers and sisters in Christ who so heavily associate with people of the world that it's not long before they stop reflecting Christ and start reflecting their friends. The behaviors become adapted to the people that they are around most often. This is why being in church is such a significant thing throughout Scripture. It's who we associate with. It's who we have what does the, the light have in common with the dark? Nothing. Nothing. Now, in, in this world, we don't really have the choice to isolate ourselves. As a matter of fact, even though I know some, some religions do that, they'll, they'll pull away and they'll, they'll do cloisters and, and they'll have no contact or very minimal contact with the outside world. We're not called to that, are we? As a matter of fact, the, the, the commission that he gave us was to go to the world. Okay? But we have to be careful how we are spending our time and with whom we're spending our time and what kind of stuff we're taking in because that's the kind of stuff that comes out. Okay, so real quick, I want to go over these again. You've got to know the Word. Dedicate yourself, discipline yourself to not only study the Scriptures, but memorize them. Memorize them contextually correct. Okay? Don't just take one out that you like because it speaks to you in a particular fragment of a thought and disregard what that thought is saying before and after. Okay? Be in prayer. Allow God's Spirit to be such in communion with you that it can immediately notify you when things are off. Three, don't rely on your own strength. You're not strong enough to overcome the enemy. That's why God's Spirit was sent. Four. Gaigo. Garbage in, garbage out. Five. Replacement principle. Once you've identified the yuck, the bad, and you've gotten rid of it, you've got to replace it with something good. It will be replaced with something. doesn't do you any good to give up one bad habit and replace it with another bad habit. Okay? Um, 
you know, uh, in, in my family, um, the generation above mine, it was smoking. And, and back in their day, that was a, a socially acceptable thing was to smoke. Well, then they started realizing all the bad effects that it had on health. And so uh, I remember distinctly at one point my mom and both of my aunts, all of them quit smoking at the same time. And they all gained weight because they replaced the smoking with eating. Okay? And I, as a matter of fact, I remember my mom going back to smoking to lose weight. Is that not just twisted? Okay? So if you're getting rid of something bad, don't replace it with something else bad. Replace it with something good. Number six, be discerning in your friendships. Be careful who you are spending your time around. Okay? How do we control our thoughts? We implement what God says helps us control our thoughts. So you don't just say, do something and then leave it up to you to figure out how it gets done. His word over and over and over again presents us with something and then shows us how to accomplish this. And over and over and over again, we understand we can't accomplish, we can't accomplish this in and of our own strength. It's got to be His Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank You. God, that we can control our thoughts. That You have given us the authority, the power, Your Spirit, to take those things that come in, to resist them, to reject them, to choose the right and deny the wrong. I ask, Lord God, that you would help us to make this a discipline. Father, that as that enemy comes in, as the tempter comes in and lays those things before us to get us off track, to indulge our flesh, in whatever manner that would be for each of us. Father, that we would be quick to see the error, the sin. That we would be quick to understand according to your word why it's wrong and what is right. That we would be sensitive because of an ongoing relationship with you. That God, we would begin to be a people that in all we say and do we would bring honor and glory to your name. That as we represent Christ to this world, our light would be strong. That it would not be diminished. We bless you today, Father, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>